I'd love for you all just to, each of you, offer your biggest takeaway. Lots of information that we just heard. What's the thing for you in your role that seems most significant and most salient? Dr. Stern, I'll start with you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jason, for all of that. It was fantastic. Um, I think for, for me, there was a lot of things that were, I think, for maybe a lot of us going, yes, I understand that to be true. I understand that to be true. I think one of the things for me that I, I most value was where you um, paused and talked a little bit about the, the feedback cycle for instructional leaders and how the rubric could be used differently to provide differentiated support for leaders. So that was significant for me. And I think the other thing uh, that needs to be talked about or that was important for me is the narrative uh, that we that we use around high performing and low performing schools, that there's a way we can talk about um, what's happening in our schools such that the leaders that are in what we call low performing schools um, might experience a greater job satisfaction simply by a, a change in narrative. Great. Yeah, I would mention two items. I, I've had the privilege of being able to um, engage with this research over the last several months and, and certainly engage with the researcher. And uh, one of the, the big takeaways is how important it is for us to have a conversation about this, not only from a policy perspective, but how we are strategically making decisions at the district perspective. So it's critical that we're elevating this conversation as a state, and we create some ways that we can all engage in solutions. I think the, the second takeaway that was an aha moment for me personally when I first saw the, the research was how critical it is for us to look at the ways the principal retains teachers and so how important it is for us to have um, some support structures around our principals to retain them in terms of how we think through strategic compensation because if they are supported then they are going to support the teachers around them and we're going to keep those highly effective teachers and so the the synergy of those two things should not be understated I think the research really elevated that too so first of all I want to thank Dr. Grissom um, I was on the edge of my seat during during the entire presentation because there was there was a lot of confirmation as, uh, as, as Chris just indicated the idea of going from a teacher to an assistant principal to principal in the a school that had 99% uh, high poverty. This, this, this data is what I lived uh, as an educator, but everything from rate of reliability and how important that is from a district standpoint, from the idea of finding those specific touch points to ensure that feedback is happening on a consistent basis for leaders in the building. Uh, the idea of multiple pathways is so important in developing that at the district level. Uh, the strategic staffing is something that I'm a believer in and, and that I live. Uh, you have to place the right leaders uh, in the right places uh, given the situation. Uh, those are just a few touch points uh, for me uh, that, uh, that I saw during the research, during the research that, uh, that really hit home. Chris, how do, you, how do you implement in your district thinking about which principles go where? So, um, so let me take you back in time a little bit to August 2015. Um, when I first arrived in Murray County Schools as a superintendent, um, I saw some structures and some processes in place that I really wasn't happy with as a, as a former assistant superintendent, as a principal, as a teacher. Um, one of the things that I didn't like is where principals were placed in the organizational chart. Um, we had certain central office supervisors that had never been a principal that were now rating principals on their effectiveness to lead their schools. Um, I saw that as a problem because they were receiving advice tied into their own evaluation which determined whether or not they kept their job based on people that had never walked in their shoes before. So one of the first things I did with grace from the school board luckily which really wasn't received well among some people in central office was is I moved principals to the top of the organizational chart. So if you look at the Murray County organizational chart right now it goes superintendent, assistant superintendent, principals, central office supervisors. So central office supervisors now serve as high-level instructional coaches to principals in their buildings. And a principal now has the authority to tell a central office supervisor, we're not going to do that in our building. But then you've got to have reasons to justify why. Because if it doesn't go well, then we have a conversation. You know, why didn't you listen to that, to that expertise? Why didn't you listen to that advice? What do you think you would have done differently? So, Candace, listening to what some of the superintendents and principals are talking about, um, as you, and as you've traveled the state and thought about and talked to people about this issue, what are the things that strike you about how placement occurs? And I think to get in a little bit to, uh, to what Miller talked about, are there state levers? And, and then we can have a little more conversation about that. So what we um, are, are thinking about and talking about across the state, and quite frankly talking to principals who are in high poverty schools, who are in turnaround school situations, is what are the types of things that you would need to actually stay 
where you are because you're highly effective and we want you here for the next five years at a minimum, what would it take? I've heard everything from I need my own mental health support. Like that would be really beneficial. I have seen, uh, you know, I've had children uh, pass away this year from crime in our neighborhood. And we have underestimated how important that is for the principal who is now providing stability, calmness, peace, moving the teachers and the students on. They need their own um, support, particularly that emotional support. So I've heard that. I've also heard from our principals in turnaround situations that while um, certainly additional funding, additional money, a different salary would be helpful, they also want um, to know that they could have additional funding to um, support and recruit and retain some of their most effective teachers. So while that would be helpful to them, and certainly I would promote that, it's also would they have a pot of money where they could say, I want to keep my most effective teachers here, and so this could be bonus money, retention money for them, or I could use that for some type of a recruitment mechanism for highly effective teachers. And then I think the third thing I would add from a policy perspective is that we do need to continue to think about the lever that the state has to um, make sure that we have the most effective um, programs that are preparing future principals. So uh, I'd love to just hear you all, Millard and Chris and then Sonia, react to some of the ideas that Candace shared and some of the things that you all, that you struggle with that might need state policy levers. You have some uh, experienced state policy people and folks who can potentially even make some changes and decisions in the room. So what would you like to see? Yeah. So, so I, looking at all schools across the entire state or across the district as all being the same is, is really a disservice because Dr. McQueen is exactly right. Uh, Murray County is unique in that we have all three subsections. I have inner city generational poverty, I have middle class suburban, and then I have rural schools all in one district of 22 schools. And to look at all of those schools as exactly the same and needing all the exact same resources it d does a disservice to those principals and to those schools. Um, we have some schools that, you know, kids vacation in Florida and their, their, their parents go to California and some who came in and their uncle was shot the previous night. So, so how we work with our principals and how we support them and, and what we do for them um, is really different. And, and I think that's the way superintendents need to look at their individual systems as not as one entire system of schools but these little, these little microcosms of our culture that the way you interact and the way you deal with and the way you work with principals has to be differently. I think it would be great uh, for our policymakers to understand or, or look at it from a lens of how can we support school districts and understand what this differentiation look like, looks like and ensure that we provide the, the monetary support, uh, the uh, policy support, everything that's needed to ensure that, uh, that we're moving kids forward. Uh, at, uh, at the same rate. So we'll completely agree uh, from the standpoint of uh, that differentiation. And we're doing something a little bit different uh, this coming year. My, my chief academic officer and I have sat down and had some conversation and he had an idea that, that I've actually practiced in the past that's going to allow us to do something uh, quite a bit different where we'll have lead principals in lieu of a, uh, an assistant superintendent. Mm -hmm. So we'll, uh, we'll uh, take away or we'll have somebody retiring uh, as assistant superintendent, or we call it something a little bit different in, in, um, in Clarksville, but uh, it'll give us the opportunity to create a brand new pipeline for a wonderful principal like a, like a, a Dr. Stewart. Uh, so instead of her moving into an assistant superintendency, we have the opportunity to move into a lead principal's role that differentiates you know, the salary by ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, allows that person to continue to lead at a level uh, where they're building capacity of principals, but at the same time, not completely pull them out of, um, uh, of the building and uh, doing what they need to do with children. So that's a, kind of an example of what it looks like. So in a minute, I want to get some thoughts, Jason, just on what this means in terms of research. But Sonia, give us a reality check, all the things that you just heard, what works, what doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so to speak to the last thing uh, that was said in terms of um, the lead principal, we've used that model here in the district. Um, I was, I had a, a lead principal that was my direct supervisor in year two. It actually, for me as a principal, was my best year feeling like I was in the work with somebody shoulder to shoulder. Mm -hmm. 
and I can say at the same time that I have other principals who would not say the same thing. So I think it really, it really depends on the quality of that lead principal and their personal approach. When I had a lead principal, they were in my building more than any other supervisor I've ever had. They were there every other week. They knew my building far better than any other supervisor ever has. And because they were in the work, even though they didn't run the same kind of school that I ran, they still ran a school. And I think that that was enormously um, helpful for me. When I think about differentiation, which is what you, you've been talking about, for us in Metro, we have student-based budgeting here. And at Pearl Cone, we've had some grants along the way. And I can't tell you, one of the things I'm most proud of at Pearl is, is our teacher retention numbers. I mean, we have 57 teachers. We only, I only hired six new teachers this year. And you know the demographics of my school, that's really, really significant. Some of that is because I can differentiate with dollars, and I can also differentiate with the way their day goes. Some have additional planning for coaching purposes. Some get to coach alongside aspiring teachers. Some get to co-teach across humanities and different things where I'm able to create these learning opportunities within my building because of some funding um, flexibility that I have that retains these teachers over time. And so I, that differentiated approach at the school level with our teachers has, had, has been enormous for the retention of teachers in my building. And so the, the, all the things you just described, are those things that you just, you'd seen other places, you thought might work, you heard feedback from your teachers, what kinds of things gave you the ideas to go in that direction? I listened a lot to my teachers. So, uh, you know, from the very beginning, I have this idea, I have this philosophy that, number one, you've got, you, if you're coming to Pearl Cone, you've got to want to be there. We're serving the highest poverty kids. You're going to work more. You're going to work harder. It's, it's going to be hard to feel effective. So you've got to really buy into that. So that sense of vision was massive for us. But then as the teachers came on, it was, what do you need? What do you, how do you want to grow and how can I help you do that? Um, for us, the, our, my highest performing teachers, they want to feel like they have direct impact on what happens in the building. My leadership team has 25 people on it. They have voting power on budget. They have enormous influence of the decisions that are made in my building. And because of that, they feel like they are part of the change that they want to see within an organization, and they feel empowered. And so that's been really significant for us.